Hives, Piscataway, Maryland is also named after my no famous Indian tribe. I think under Governor O'Malley, the Piscataways were trying to get recognition as an official um, Native American tribe. They, they got to almost like the highest level you could before recognition, and they did not get recognition. I'm not really sure where it's standing with Governor Hogan. So anyway, so in June of um, June of 1608, John Smith sails up the um, tributary of the Potomac River, what we now know as the Potomac River, and made contact with 80 Nacotch Tank warriors. There's a very famous map that probably was on one of Mr. Muhammad's um, placards. But uh, in 1612, he goes back to England and draws up a map of kind of essentially the Maryland, Virginia, Chesapeake region, and there's a little hut, Nacotch Tank. And um, that's kind of where like the name Anacostia first derived from. So who were the Nakach tanks? The Nakach tank were kind of an independent tribe. Um, you must understand that um, a lot, essentially, what we know of Native American is really from English or Anglo-American or European that wrote down the history. The language was not captured on any sort of parchment or paper. So everything we kind of know about Native Americans is essentially trying to interpret archaeology or what these English people had to say. So um, when, when uh, John Smith is, makes contact with the Nakach tanks, there's a gen gentleman named Henry Spellman. So they kind of had this barter system where um, they would give like an apprentice. OK, here's a young man. Spellman was about 14 years at the time. We'll leave Henry Spellman with you. That way you can trust us. And then they kind of start up some sort of, some sort of, kind of nego um, trading system. Beaver pellets were a form of currency. This is kind of really before tobacco cultivation hit the new world. Um, so beaver pellets were very popular as a trading thing. This area was um, abundant with sturgeon, beaver. Um, there's all sorts of accounts of what wildlife actually was here. It's like you said, there was a lot of um, wildlife in this region. So okay, so fast forward to 1622. There's this English gentleman named Henry Fleet. For those of you familiar with like Virginia, Maryland. There's a Fleet Island. Henry Fleet later went to serve in, went to serve in um, the Virginia State Assembly, but in um, in 1622 um, they make contact with the Nakach tanks. Henry Spellman at this time has learned the local language and started to translate it. Then there was kind of this big beef, this big war. If you read any histories of Maryland, they talk about the 1622 war. Um, there were a lot of Nakach tanks who were um, slaughtered. Um, the Nakash tanks were at times at war with sort of the other local tribes. Um, Powhatan, who I mentioned was in Northern Virginia, kept a pretty tight control over the local tribes, but it's believed that um, the Iroquois actually had served as kind of protection for Powhatan. The Nakash tanks were kind of an independent tribe. Then you have the Neocostans, which are up in Delaware, the Piscataways down in Southern Maryland. So anyway, so I'm probably giving you more than maybe is necessary. But uh, the history the history of the Nakash tanks is very interesting. Um, I've recently conducted some research at the Maryland State Archives, and when they started to give land grants, they would mention this uh, the Indian Fort. So uh, I believe that the Indian Fort is probably in what is today in Acosti Park, directly across the river from Nationals Park. Frequently it would say, um, Mr. Muller deeds land to Mr. Muhammad, 36 meters from the Nakash tank fort by this and that dimensions. Um, so yeah, so the, the, there was some sort of Indian fort in this in this area, which probably pre-existed uh, John Smith um, visiting here. Uh, Father Andrew White, who if you go to Georgetown University, they will say that Father Andrew White is actually the founding founder of Georgetown. He was a missionary sent from the Catholic Church to this region. There's a famous painting called the um, Landing um, of the Ark and the Dove in Maryland, which happened in what year? 1634. Usually when I give history and I give tours, I kind of try to make it interactive. So excuse my methods. But anyway, so 1634 is when, when it's um, believed that the Ark and the Dove landed in Maryland. And um, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with Southern Maryland, like St. Mary's County, Leonardtown. Um, so that was actually really the capital of Maryland before Annapolis. That was where the first civilization or first civilization, the first European settling of Maryland was in Southern Maryland. So Father Andrew White is a missionary. He travels up and down um, the tributaries and the waterways, and he makes, he makes contact with some Nakach tank warriors who he tries to, um, what's the word, try to, 
convert. There's another word. There's another word. There's another word I'm thinking of. Yeah. You see, so he's prophesied. Prostatizing, <laughs> trying to convert um, Anacostians, which he's unsuccessful. Um, he writes a book in the 1640s called Relations on Maryland, where he discusses this in detail. I actually did some research where the Vatican Library in Rome actually has his original correspondence where he, he discusses this. It's very fascinating. Um, John Addison, who Addison Road is named after, who Oxen Hill is also named after, John Addison. Um, there's actually whole many Addisons. You might know Christian was Christian Carter Addison. He's a local guy. He's run for mayor. He writes this book. He's he's featured up at the Smithsonian Museum. He's related to the Addisons. Um, but anyway, so John Addison came. He went to Oxford University. He came to this area. He bought up a lot of land. Oxen Hill is actually named after John Addison. Decided to name Oxen Hill in lieu of Oxford. Um, John Madis John Addison was in the militia. Uh, there's Records of the Maryland State Assembly going back to the 1690s where they had to form a militia to protect settlers from attacks by local um, Native Americans. It's really not, it's really not known when the Nakash tank kind of left this area, what happened to them. Um, this road, which is now Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, which before that was named Nichols Road after Dr. Charles H. Nichols, who was the superintendent at St. Um, Elizabeth's. Before that, it was known as Piscataway Road. It's believed that it actually was an old Indian, old Native American path that goes back to, I mean, potentially thousands of years. And so we're on basically all the way from uh, what is now Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, Good Oak Road. All, and if anyone kind of takes it, you can go all the way. You go, basically, it goes all the way to essentially Piscataway, Maryland. So, um, yeah, there was also this guy named John H. Um, John H. Shannon, who uh, was a writer for the Evening Star, he was known as the Rambler. He wrote in the um, early 1900s to the 1920s. He wrote um, a couple <laughs> articles about the genesis of the name Good Hope Road. It's believed that it actually um, Good Hope Road was translated from uh, the Nakach tanks spoken Algonquin-based language. Um, it's believed that it was translated from an Algonquin word to mean Good Hope. And that the Good Hope Row name actually goes back, it predates the tavern. There's something called the Good Hope Tavern. Some people think that the name Good Hope Road comes from the Good Hope Tavern, but it's probably more so that the Good Hope Tavern got the name from Good Hope Road. Um, what's some other interesting history? So, yeah, so then, so John Addison, one of John Addison's, I guess, grandsons was the rector of St. John's Church, St. John's Episcopal Church, which is the Church of the Presidents, which is right there by the White House. So a lot of the history goes back um, far ways. Um, let's see, let's fast. Is it the same St. John's Church as here? Um, well, this, well this, the St. John's Church by the, on Pennsylvania Avenue, not Pennsylvania Avenue, it's at 8th Street. 8th Street and, was that 16th and 8th Street? Uh -huh. the Saint jo that St. John's Episcopal Church um, was founded by, I guess, John Addison's grandson or great-grandson. Nice. Um, and then, are you thinking of the... Um, the St. John's has been here since early, like late 1800s. And it used to be the CME Church, right? Oh, yeah, it was the United Episcopal Society. Um, no well, affiliation. Well, 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 that's... Well, they, uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no well, 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 that's a great question, because a lot of the churches here are very, very old. As many of you know, St. Teresa of Avila, which is at, um, was it 12th and B, 13th and B Street? That was chartered in August, uh, or opened in August of 1879. It was the first Roman Catholic church east of the river. It actually predates the Archdiocese of Washington by 50 years. The Archdiocese of Washington did not break from the Archdiocese of Baltimore until 1939, something like that. Um, and then, as you know, probably the um, congregation was segregated at St. Teresa. The white parishioners told the black parishioners to basically worship downstairs, so they didn't like that. So then they left and they founded the church up on the hill. Yeah, our Lady Perpetual Help, which is, I believe, founded in 1918, I think. And then another offshoot of St. Teresa founded um, St. Francis, which is on Pennsylvania Avenue, I think 23rd Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and then I'm not sure if there's other, other Catholic churches. Um, but, uh, yeah, so a lot of the, the, all the Catholic churches are that are east of the river, the genesis came from St. Teresa. Um, probably... Some of you remember George Shong, which I won't get into because he was at St. Teresa. Um, so, 
1854, these three guys from um, Philadelphia and Baltimore formed this land corporation called the Uniontown Land, Uniontown land Trust. Uniontown was kind of a very early branding name, just like they call like Pen Quarter or um, certain neighbor, you know, neighborhoods have certain sort of names like Noma and all these other things. It was a branding effort. So Uniontown, 1854, you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That's when John Brown and his, his sons went out to... Up um, Kansas and kind of hacked up some people. That's a whole other story. But anyway, so it was, it was very, it was a very divisive time. So it's believed that the name Uniontown was essentially because it was like kind of non-political or very um, welcoming. Uniontown. Oh. So anyway, when Uniontown was founded, as those that have read the Anacostia story by Miss uh, um, Hutchinson, who passed away two years ago now, I guess she has a one of the charters. So when Uniontown was founded in 1854 by this guy, these guys, John Fox, John Dobler, and John Van Hook. John Van Hook built the house that Frederick Douglass then later bought. Uh, it was a racially restrictive neighborhood. It had certain covenants. So there were um, restrictions on no pigs, no Irish, no mulattoes, and no people of African descent. So it was very restrictive. Um, there's a lot of early theories and speculation about that the neighborhood was for workers from the Navy Yard. Some of my research thinks that's maybe not true. Um, U Street, which is Jackson Street, or U Street today, which was then Jackson Street, when, 1850, when Uniontown was founded in 1854, it took on the name of the president. So, um, uh, for example, 14th Street was Pierce Street, um, W Street was Jefferson Street, um, you had Fillmore Street, Pierce Street, the, 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 first, the first 14 presidents, because like I said, it was kind of a branding effort. So, anyway, so Jackson Street, which is today U Street, if you look at the house that has, like, kind of has the cupola on top, it's the Italianette um, style house. I don't know if anyone knows what house I'm talking about. Um, there's some other houses that are on U Street that are pretty old, and those houses are pretty opulent. They're not small houses. And going back in the D.C. land records, the first houses built in Uniontown were on... Um, Jackson Street, so they were not of modest means. Um, I spoke to a lady who uh, was 95 years old who lived on um, 14th Street, and she told me that the wealthy people in Anacostia lived in Mapleview and Mountview because that's where the lawyers and rich folks live. But that's, that's a whole. That, and if you look at those houses, those are they have uh, expansive porches mm -hmm. and everything. So, anyway, so 1854 happens, um, and just like it's happening today, as I was speaking to my friend here about the. There's a lot of real estate speculation going on at Anacostia. It's been happening probably for the past five years. I would say maybe even hyper accelerated the past two or three years. People will buy a house for $200,000, fix it up, put it on the market for $500,000, and it's not, it's not selling. So Uniontown, when they um, tried to sell the lots, they would sell lots, and people would buy the lots, and then two or three or four years later, they would default on the lots because they wouldn't pay the taxes because they were buying the lots, thinking that people were going to rush over to this area of town to buy them. Um, the Civil War happens. Um, John Wilkes Booth, after he shoots Abraham Lincoln, he meets Davy Harold at what corner? Bottom uh, of Good Hope Road. Exactly. So, 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 after, so after, after John Wood Bridge. He shoots President Lincoln, he goes across the Navy Yard Bridge, also known as the Eastern Branch, Eastern Branch Bridge. He meets Davy Harold. They ride up Good Hope Road out to. Um, Nail the Road. Was then, yeah. Nail Road, which is named after Henry Naylor, Marble Pike, and now Southern Avenue, and um, out to me with Dr. Samuel Mudd. Um, there's actually a couple books of people who, or books and interviews of people in the 1880s and 1890s that talk about how one of Booth's plots was actually to try to kidnap President Lincoln when he was visiting St. Elizabeth's, which is then known as the Government Hospital for the Insane. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, Confederate sympathizers in Anacostia, which is a whole other element of his history that not a lot of people know about. There was a book in the 1989 called Come Retribution, and it talks about if you were coming from Southern Maryland, whether it be um, St. Mary's County, Charles County, and you were coming to Washington City, the farthest you could come was to the corner of Good Hope and MLK, which was then um, Nichols Avenue and Harrison Street. Um, because if you go one across the bridge, you had to show a pass of what you were doing. There's a story of actually someone being... <laughs> kind of a disgusting story. But there was someone hidden in a cart in a bunch of manure. And so they're passing, trying to go to Washington City, and essentially the manure moves, and the, the, the bridge constable is saying, well, what is that? And he looks inside the manure, and there was somebody hiding. He was actually arrested for being, for being thought, he was arrested on suspicions of being a Confederate spy. He was later let go. 
um, but that's a very strange story. There's a gentleman named Ling, uh, Lingard B. Anderson, who was one of the first members of the Metropolitan Police Department. He, um, Anacostia, was known as the 11th Precinct. This is well before this building was built in 1908 at Shannon. The Whitman Walker Clinic was the original, well, not original, was an early, an early police station that was opened in 1908. I think that was 11th Precinct, mm -hmm. Anacostia was 11th mm -hmm. Precinct. So. Yeah. so when the Metropolitan Police Department was founded in 1861, there were three officers for the entire east of the river, and there was two horses. And um, Anderson is interviewed in 1918. He lived right by the corner of 16th and W Street. His house is still there. I got an email from a descendant. That's a whole other story. But he was interviewed in 1918, and he says how in the immediate aftermath of the Lincoln assassination, that him and another officer went in it, went through Anacostia looking for John Wilkes Booth because they thought he might be hiding out. Uh, in the Lincoln Conspiracy Trial transcripts, um, that lady Mary Surratt, who don't believe what you've heard, she was guilty. She knew what was going on. Mary Surratt was actually seen in and around uh, Uniontown in the immediate uh, weeks before the assassination. Dr. Samuel Mudd was also seen in Uniontown. So there's obviously something going on in and around this time period when John Wilkes Booth was plotting to assassinate um, President Lincoln. Let's see. Uh, so Civil War happens. Then in 1867, there was a gentleman named General Oliver Otis Howard, which what university is named after? Mm 